And let's take a look at uh, modeling with second order differential equations. So here we have a simple harmonic motion. For this particular experiment, you're only going to need a spring and a mass. So suppose that you have a spring of some natural length L. So this will be the natural length of the spring. And then after you attach the mass to the spring, then it's being stretched some distance L. So now that's the uh, stretch of the spring once you attach the mass. And now our goal is to displace the mass from its equilibrium position and let it go. And the mass will oscillate up and down. And the differential equations we're going to model will help us to determine the position of the mass at any given time t. In a perfect world, of course, the mass will continue to oscillate. But in, in real world, we know that there are so many other forces that can be acting on this uh, experiment and then other things could happen. But we're not talking about that. We're just looking at this ideal scenario, a mass and a spring. And you either pull it down or compress it upward and observe the observe, um, behavior of this motion. Now, some things to keep in mind is, let's suppose we're going to be assuming that going pulling it downward, that will be our positive direction. And then pulling it upward would be the negative direction. So once your direction are fixed, then um, it is easier for you to determine the forces acting on this. There's only two forces acting on this. We have the gravitational force pulling it downward, and we have the spring force pulling the mass upward. So we're going to be using the differential equations mu double prime plus gamma times u prime plus k times u equals to some external force. So since we're assuming only free oscillation, meaning no damping involved, so these are going to be zero, no external force being applied. These are all zero. So our differential equation comes down to u m times u double prime plus k times u equals to zero. And we will have an initial condition u of zero, the initial position of the mass, and also u prime at zero, the initial velocity of the mass. So these are the criteria we're going to be needing when it comes to solving the differential equation that models this particular ideal scenario. Now, how do we figure out M? Well, we know that the, uh, the weight is going to be mass times G, where G, we're going to choose it to be either 9.8 meter per second squared or uh, 32 feet per second squared, depending on the units given in the problem. So if you uh, solve for M in this formula, you'll have M is equal to the weight divided by G. So that's one way you'll figure out the unknown coefficient m. And then k is, of course, the spring constant. So we know that the k can be determined by using the following formula. So we know the weight is equal to k times L, where L is the amount the spring is stretched once you attach the mass. So then this will be equal to k is equal to the weight over L. So these are the ways you're going to find these constants k and m. So let's try to uh, design this problem. So we have a mass weighing three pounds stretches a spring three inches. If the mass is pushed upward, contracting the spring at a distance of one inch, and then set in motion with the downward velocity of two feet per second. If there's no damping, find the position u of the mass at any time t. And then we'll figure out other steps such as frequency, amplitude, and period, which is not a big deal because at this point you have learned uh, lots of pre-calculus uh, concepts that should be fresh in your mind. So let's, let's, let's see how we can set this up. So you want to figure out these uh, coefficients m and k based on the given information and also the initial conditions. So we're given the mass weights this much. Okay, so we know the weight the w let's call it weight the w is equal to three pound and we know that weight is equals to mass times the gravitational constant so that means i can solve for m so by simply dividing it by g so you will have w divided by g that'll give you m so if the weight is 
three pounds, so let's say three. And to keep the unit consistent, um, if you read further in the problem, you'll see that uh, we're given inches. Now, if you look at the gravitational constant G, that is given in terms of either uh, 9.8 meter per second square, or you can have 32 feet per second square. So to go from inches to meter per second, that wouldn't make sense. So we'll go from inches to feet. So we'll convert that, which means we will use 32 as our G for mass as well. And there you have it. This is how you're going to figure out your value for M. So this is our M. So now that we figure out M, let's go ahead and find K. Well, K is the spring constant, as you might have already known that. Uh, we know that the spring, uh, once you touch the mass, it is it stretches the spring three inches. So what that means is our stretch, let's call it L, it's going to be three inches. Now we need to convert that to feet. So we know one foot is 12 inch. So that will give us one uh, fourth uh, foot for the stretch. Uh, the weight is equal to K times L. L, you can represent it as a stretch or it could be the amount of displaced. So this would be equal to K is equal to W over L. So that's another formula you should remember. Eight is um, three and L is one fourth. So this is one over four. And then this would turn out to be 12. So our K value is 12. And now we're ready to go. So we're ready to um, fill in the information and write down our system. So I'm just going to get rid of all of this. So we know our model is going to be 3 over 32 u double prime plus k, that's 12 u, is equal to 0. Now let's see why this makes sense. So if you read further in the problem, you'll see that uh, if the mass is pushed upward, now that's the initial condition. Now you're you're doing something to the mass after <clears throat> you attached it to the spring. So you push upward and contracting the spring at a distance of one inch. So that is your initial, you're positioning the mass upward. So that's negative one inch. In other words, in feet, this is going to be uh, negative one over 12 feet. And then with the downward velocity, so that means now the velocity is going to be positive. Your initial velocity would be two feet per second. So remember, if you push upward, uh, that will be negative because up, upward is a negative direction and downward is a positive direction. Be mindful of that. So those two information gave us the initial conditions. And if there's no damping force, of course, we mentioned that we're doing simple harmonic and there's no external force. That's why we set it to zero. Now we want to solve this and then figure out the rest of it. All right, so hopefully this makes sense. Now let's go ahead and solve it. So to solve it, you can go ahead and write down the characteristic from here, but I'm going to go ahead and get rid of this coefficient. So I, um, I'm, uh, it's simpler to work with. So what we can do, we can multiply by 32 over three on both sides. So you'll have u double prime plus 12 times 32 over three u is equal to zero. And that's gonna give us u double prime plus 128 u equals to zero. So then assuming the solution is an exponential, we know the characteristic polynomial of this would be r square plus 128 equals to zero. And then this would give you r square is equal to negative 128. And then when you take the square root of it, you'll get r is equal to plus and minus square root of 128. So this is actually a negative, which means we have imaginary roots. So this is equal to plus and minus square root of 128 i. And then if you simplify this, 128 can be simplified as 64 times 2i. And 64 will simplify uh, the square root of 64. So that would be 8 square root of 2i. So that is our r for this uh, characteristic polynomial. So we know our solution is in, uh, in terms of sine and cosine. So your u of t 
the solution, it's going to be some constant C1 cosine of 8 square root of 2t plus C2 sine of 8 square root of 2t. So hopefully you know how to get to this at this point. I am leaving out some of the steps, but if you do need help with them, I'll leave some similar uh, videos in the description box for you. So now we got the solution, but we need to figure out our uh, constant C1 and C2. So um, we're going to impose the initial conditions now. So let's take these on the bottom and apply these initial conditions. So for the first condition, we apply it to u. So u of 0 is equal to negative 1 over 12, which means negative 1 over 12 is equal to, when you plug in 0 for t over here and over here, sine of 0 is 0. So the sine term will disappear. Cosine of 0 is 1. So you, that will give us c1 times 1, which just means c1 is equal to negative 1 over 12. So we got c1. Now c2, we're going to uh, use the derivative to find that. You'll see that. So the second condition is applied to the derivative of the solution. So we take the derivative of u of t. So the derivative of uh, cosine of 8 square root of 2t. So we have 8 square root of 2 c1 sine will be negative sine of 8 square root of 2t. And then uh, the derivative of sine 8 square root of 2t is going to be cosine of that times 8 square root of 2t. So we got 8 square root of 2 c2 times cosine of 8 square root of 2t. All right, now we plug in the second condition. So we know that u prime at 0 is 2. So that means 2 is equal to, if you plug in 0, now check this out. This one will disappear because it has sine in it. Sine of 0 is 0. So we can only use the second term. So you got 8 square root of 2 times c2 times cosine of 0 is 1. So that leaves us with 2 over 8 square root of 2 is equal to c2 which can be simplified as 1 over 4, a square root of 2 is equal to c2. There you have it. So now we're ready to uh, write down our solution. So I'm just going to grab our solution from here and plug in the values for c1 and c2. So to answer the first part of this problem, we are ready to go. So c1, that's negative 1 over 12, and c2, that's 1 over 4 square root of 2. So there you have the solution, which describes the position of the mass at any given time, t. Now, if you uh, look up, the problem asks us to find a few more information about this solution. Now, this solution, as you can see, it only involves sine and cosine. So when you actually graph it in a computer device, you will see that uh, it it will, it will just look like sine and cosine wave together. So I will leave, I'll leave that up to you to check it out. But let's try to figure out the rest, uh, the frequency and period and the amplitude of this motion. So frequency, right? So uh, frequency, we're going to label it as omega. So omega is this number right here. And they're always the same for both sine and cosine. So that number is your omega. So frequency is going to be 8 square root of 2. And then the next thing we want to talk about is the amplitude. Now amplitude, there is a formula for this. So amplitude, we often write it as, uh, you can call it A or R. It's going to be the square root of uh, this number squared plus this number squared. So it's going to be negative 1 over 12 squared plus 1 over 4 square root of 2 squared. That's how you figure out the amplitude of a motion where you have both sine and cosine. There is a way to prove this, but I'm going to leave the proof out for this video. So this is equal to, you'll get one uh, square root of 1 over 144 plus 
1 over uh, 4 squared, that would be 16. <clears throat> and then times 2, so about 32. And then as you add up these fractions, you will get that this is equal to the square root of 11 over 288. And you can play around with it, but I'm, I'm going to claim this is my amplitude. And the next thing we want to figure out is the period. So the period, let's call it P, that's going to be 2 pi over omega, which is the frequency, as we know that from uh, pre-calculus, that it's 2 pi because sine and cosine completes one cycle at 2 pi divided by the frequency. So in this case, we will have 2 pi divided by uh, our frequency, which happens to be 8 square root of 2. And then if you simplify this, you'll get pi over 4 square root of 2. So that will be the period of this motion. All right, I hope this helps you understand simple harmonic motion. Take care.